Bonsoir, bienvenue. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, architects, students. It is our very big pleasure to welcome uh, Peter Cook amongst us tonight. A big pleasure for EPFL, a big pleasure also for us from Alice and uh, also from Archisum, uh, who is co-organizing this lecture tonight. Peter Cook already has been with us this afternoon. We had very engaged discussions. Peter Cook is principal of Crab Studio, practicing architect in London. He has built buildings around the world, amongst which the Kunsthaus in Graz, which has become one of the most important Austrian and European landmarks in the last decade, one could say. Peter Cook is co-founder, was co-founder of Archigram in the early 60s. He co-founded Archigram together with Michael Webb, Ron Heron, uh, oh, David sorry. Green, David Green, Warren and, Shaw, and, and Dennis Crompton. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> and your project and Archigram Archigram projects have been very influential uh, for many of today's still leading practices, such as Norman Foster, Oma, Rem Kolhas, and many others. Peter Cook is also a very important educator. He has been teaching at the AA, was director of the Städelschule in Germany, chair of Bartlett and has been for many generations a very important figures, figure in theory and education of architecture. Peter, it's a very big pleasure to have you with us. The floor is yours. Thank you. I think I last spoke in this school 38 years ago, uh, which um, was in another building, I think. <laughs> Must have been, mustn't it? Um, I think it came up in the conversation this afternoon that I, I myself am always very um, interested in, in the biographies of students or of anybody else I come upon. Um, I think that, and, and as I was saying earlier this afternoon here, that however much the atmosphere of the college or the, the, the school of your teachers, of, of, of certain things that you read, however much that Im, impinges upon you. Also, I think very important is the subconscious experience, what you see out of the corner of your eye, what you are affected by, even if you don't admit it at the time. And being possibly the oldest person in the room, um, I, I suspect that some of you will come to realize that uh, and, and at the point at which you realize it, you, you also realize there isn't much you can do about it. Um, on the other hand, one at certain points becomes self-conscious about this. And I have chosen a, 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 a very peripatetic childhood. My father was an army officer, and I moved from town to town. I went, I think, to 12 different schools in 10 different towns. Um, I have chosen to regard myself as the child of the seaside, even if technically, between the age of, of, of naught and, and, say, 22, uh, I only probably lived at the seaside a third of that time. I think it was the seaside that is a characteristic that has um, affected certainly the archigram period of my life. I think that archigram, the notion of the of the temporal, the, the notion of the, of, the, of the environment that comes and goes is really a mirror of what happens in, in the seaside, where a town, certainly in the English seaside, will be almost dead in the winter. And then in the spring, people start coming out and they start painting things and they start unopening uh, enclosures and they start wiring up electrics, and gradually the people come, and the town metamorphoses into something quite different. And then 
towards September, October, it, it shrinks back again, folds up upon itself. And, and all those ideas about metamorphosis and about the, the plug-in city and the removable and the replaceable and the, and the developable, I think stem from that quite naturally. But what I want to start off with are two pictures here of two of the towns I lived in. Uh, the one on the, on the left, Felixstowe, is a very small and insignificant seaside town on the east coast of, the, of England. And this lunar park, this Butlins lunar park, was something that always struck me as being special at the time. It's only later, re-photographing it and putting these labels on it, that I can say what I was experiencing as a 12-year-old was, in fact, a very intriguing juxtaposition of, of objects. A megastructure, which was the helter-skelter. We didn't think, I didn't think of it as being a megastructure, but that, in a sense, is what it was. Underneath the helter-skelter was the crazy house, a funny building made out of ferro-cemento uh, in order to be crazy, was, in a sense, a piece of expressionism. I didn't know anything about German expressionism at the time, but in a funny way, that's what it was. And the building, the cafe building next to them, uh, though in an English rather provincial way, was actually a piece of art deco. I, didn't know, I wouldn't have even known what art deco was time, but to get a megastructure and a piece of expressionism and an art deco building together is an unusual thing, and I don't think Felix Stowe realized what it had got, but somehow stirring in me were the instincts to be intrigued by such things. We moved the clock forward probably 10 or nearly 10 years, and I lived uh, until I moved to London in a town called Bournemouth. And I went to my first architecture school in Bournemouth, which was part of the art, the art college. And you could pay a penny and go down the lift if you were very lazy. Uh, and you could pay another penny and go up the cliff lift if you were tired. And, of course, what it was was a piece of technology. Now, Archigram was always referred to as being very, very interested in technology. I think in, in using such apparatus, one is living with technology, but you don't sort of single it out and say, this is technology. It just happened to be a way of getting up and down the, up and down the cliff. And of course, the Victorian period, from which those cliff lifts probably originate, or, or a little later, um, was a wonderful period for incorporating technology in quite a nonchalant way. But I think that seaside experience stayed with me. This is some more detail about Bournemouth, the town where I first went to architecture school. It is curiously a, a, a successful beach town, quite a large one, and re the repository of a lot of English uh, neo-Gothic churches. It's probably the biggest collection of neo-Gothic churches in the south of England. Um, and the other thing that, of course, was going on was that the School of Architecture, the little tiny school that I went to before I then went on to the AA, was the last place in England where we were taught, where we were taught to use classical rules and where you were taught to, to be able to do all the five orders of architecture by using proportional dividers, where you went out to measure some of these neo-Gothic churches with pieces of lead which you wrapped around the tracery of the building and then you put them on the paper and drew around them and then you made drawings from that so that you were supposed to understand what the, um, what the methods of, of both classical and Gothic architecture were about. And we were forced to read books such as this which is called... Um, James Gibbs' Rules for Drawing the Several Parts of Architecture. And if you're a good student, you follow the rules. <coughs> but of course, the other thing that was going on out of the corner of my eye 
was the fact that this particular town was a kind of Arcadian construct. It was built and developed really for the people from the industrial north of England who went to retire and die. And because the climate is rather good, they lived for some years longer than they expected to and were encouraged to take these perambulations amongst the trees, these walks amongst the trees. A lot of funny things going on in, under trees there, including some strange neo neo castle buildings which were doing useful things like storing water and so on. But at the age of 14, I became consciously interested in architecture and raided the local public library for everything I could learn about architecture. I had persuaded my parents to take me to see castles. I collected castles rather like some people collect stamps. I would insist on going to look at castle after castle and Roman towns and cathedrals and I made balsa wood models of cathedrals. And then around the age of 15 I discovered Le Corbusier in the public library and after Le Corbusier suddenly I think the most exciting illustration I found was this one, <coughs> which was a building pulled down before I was born. Uh, by, and the building was in Stockholm for the Stockholm 1930 exhibition. It was Gunnar Asplund's uh, restaurant. And I saw this picture and I was bewitched by it. And I'm still bewitched by it because I have no way of seeing it. it the building was pulled down. There'd never been anything more than black and white photographs. I don't know what it would have been like in color. <coughs> and it was wonderful. To me, this was something else. It, no, I left behind those castles and cathedrals and, 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 and living in towns such as Norwich, which has 40 medieval churches. And if you live in a town that has 40 medieval churches, you get a bit bored with med medieval churches after a while. You sort of know what they do and say, yes, medieval, medieval, yes, why not? But this was something wonderful. It looked like an aeroplane. It was, it, was, it was thin and it was light and it let the light through and it had this... It's still, I find, a bewitching image. And I discovered this before I went to the architecture school. Even though I went to the architecture school at the age of 16, I had already become a fan of modernism, of this kind of modernism, this light modernism. And then going to this school where you had to learn the classical orders and the neo-Gothic and the measuring these things and drawing from Victorian books of ornament. Very strange. So I went sort of, asked about faith. I went backwards, so to speak. The resulting me, who knows what it was the product of it? Was it the product of all those different towns I lived in? Was it the product of, of going into a sort of double reversal, looking at the very old things then growing away from them, and then being taught to look at them again. And then when I came finally to the AA, being taught really how to look at them, because some of our teachers, like James, uh, John Summerson, were, were brilliant uh, teachers of history. And then I came to London, and after the AA, after working in offices, I started to meet some rather interesting guys who were called Archigram, or now called historically called Archigram. We were 10 years apart in age, the oldest to the youngest, and no two from the same school. Everybody had different taste in clothes, different taste in girlfriends, different taste in music, different taste in food. We were not all the same ilk. And I think that was the strength of Archigram, that we were a coalition of very different personalities. We produced this magazine, which was a sort of anti-magazine. It, it was a sheet that changed its format. Each time we produced one, it had a different format deliberately to see what you could get out of cheap printing. And, and, and then we would even make some of the archigrams like children's books. We, we des had designed some towers, and we made the towers into a pop-up. We said, ah, pop, pop up, it pops up like a kid's book. 
And, and people were very puzzled by us making fun of our own work. But I warn you, beware of the English when they are being funny. You may not find it funny, but they are then at their most serious. We have a natural tendency to send up anything that takes itself too seriously. It is our defense mechanism. It is also the basis of our creativity, I think. Now, every member of Archigram, as I said, was different. And we, in a sense, used to parry with each other. We used to sort of compete with each other through the individual projects. Most of the things on this page are individual projects, except the one on the top right, which was a, a, a project more or less done by everybody, which was, curiously enough, a competition project for that same town of Bournemouth, which, needless to say, we didn't win. And we were paid for, for a while, by a big building contractor. We managed to all get a job working for this big building contractor, which had set up a kind of experimental design group. And for two or more years, we were paid quite well to supposedly design prefabricated concrete housing and some housing schemes and a railway station, none of which really got built. But we also experimented, and we used to buy all the Italian and French magazines. We, you would have Warren Chalk sitting in a site hut on the site of a building with his feet up, reading uh, Japan Architect and Architecture de Jodoui and Domus and, 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 and such things and Casabella. And we would have an, an amazing time. And we were producing our own magazines. And at the same time, this, this, this uh, construction company paid money for me to develop my particular tower, which was this one. And my God, it, it is 50 years ago. It's frightening. Um, it was meant to be a tower for a World's Fair being held in Montreal, but uh, it didn't actually happen. But the construct is still of interest to me, and you'll see why a little bit later. And then it came that I was giving a lot of uh, jury sessions at the AA. I won a small competition about a year and a half out of school and suggested, cheekily suggested myself to the school that I would like to come and be a critic. And they said, yes, tr we'd try you out. And I was obviously considered good at it because then I was going in and out of the A like a yo-yo. I, 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 I was in there about every week on some jury or other. And then the school said, look, this is getting stupid. Why don't we put you on the payroll? And I was hired as the, a very special role, a sort of humble role. I was the assistant to the fifth-year master. Now, the fifth-year master was the teacher in charge of the diploma year, and the assistant would, was meant to be a sort of useful young guy who would be helpful, would sort of walk behind the professor and, and, and mop up afterwards and, and be a, a useful shoulder to cry upon. Except that my plug-in city project, this thing, had been published about six weeks before I started the job. When I say it had been published, I don't mean it had been published in a fairly obscure architecture magazine. It had been published in the most popular color supplement in England, which at that time sold one and a half million copies, the Sunday Times color supplement. It was all there in color. And every one of those students to whom I was introduced by my boss, they said, this is Peter Cook, he's going to be my assistant. Those students, they told me afterwards, they sat there saying, Fuck, have we got to do that kind of stuff? <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. <coughs> I never had the benefit of anonymity. I never had that useful benefit of anonymity that certain teachers have where they can just be somebody in a little room or who pops out of the little room or comes around and says, uh, yes, I think I can be quite helpful with that staircase, you know, and well, why don't you go home and have a rest or... You know, why don't you ditch your boyfriend or any pieces of useful, useful tutorial advice? I never had that. I never had that, that luxury because I was the peacock who'd done that fucking weird scheme in the newspaper. 
bloody hell, we're going to all do that. What was weird was that actually I spent the first year or year and a half teaching hardly doing any drawing. I became what I realized was the need was to be effectively an amateur psychologist. Ten of my students were older than me. One of them was twice my age and couldn't design. And that's very difficult. How do you handle that? And I realized that a lot of what goes on in an architecture school is to do with faith and support and keeping interested and a, a number, of, number of things which are not necessarily architectural issues but are personal issues. And then gradually I got the hang of it and, 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 and started to draw again. The Plug-in City, this is a rather comp complex drawing of, of part of it. And it lasted probably for almost two years in, from the beginning to the end, from the very first little models made of sort of sticks, little wooden sticks, including the, the tower, and then developed, and then ideas about electric cars, and then developed further, and then developed a university element, which was particular in its own right, and then looked at, at ways in which it would infiltrate pieces of suburbia and so on. So probably from the beginning to the end, it was about two years. And then came a number of projects, often questioning the city, if the plug-in city or the instant city were anti-cities. The idea of the instant city being really a travelling element of city that would bring culture to even a village and then travel on like a, a travelling circus. Um, or there were cars that, that, that were pieces of furniture or pieces of furniture that were cars. Or there were houses that would disintegrate or melt or villages that would suddenly pop up. These, in a way, were questioning the tradition of the town or the vehicle or the house or the village. But in a way, were by so doing, I think, in love with the tradition of the house, the village, and so on. Now, sometimes I found myself using a particular focus upon which to develop ideas about places. I travel a great deal and have done since the beginning of the archigram period. And I have, made, I have done a number of tower projects. So far, and I say so far, optimistically, nobody has commissioned me to do a tower. But I commissioned myself um, making a kind of rule that I have to know the place for at least one month before I'll entertain the idea of doing a tower. One of the cities I've been to many times and have certainly spent many months in is Oslo in Norway. And one of my early tower projects was this series of towers for Oslo, which at that time, notice the date, didn't have any hardly had any, it was about one high-rise building. And one of the characteristics of Oslo is that, of course, it's, it's north, it's dark, it has very cheap electricity, and it also has a, a repository of lanterns, particularly in the period of about 1920, 1930. These lanterns, which you often get at the top of shopping streets, running along just above eye level. And I was fascinated by these, and then I had this idea that the housing towers would be made of these lanterns, and that then I would associate the idea of this illuminated lantern with an English tradition, which is also, I think, a French tradition, of the little bay window, the little window that you look out of. And then, as you move up the tower, the windows get bigger to the size of a whole room, and then higher up, the windows get bigger to the size of a whole apartment. And finally, at the top of the tower, the whole top of the tower is a lantern. So it's like lantern, 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 lantern. And celebrates this notion of, of the electric light as, 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 as the, the symbol of the tower. The room 
is this another thing I noticed in Oslo many times, is that people leave their curtains open and they light their rooms in this dark darkness. You often get these lit lit rooms. You can just about see somebody moving. Sometimes you can't see anything going on, but they light their rooms. In the daytime, those same towers are colored. The colors very ch- carefully chosen. I noticed that a lot of the functionalist architecture of Oslo of the 1920s and 30s used a certain palette of colors. I then discovered by going to the National Art Museum that these colors were used by a lot of Norwegian painters which in turn had quoted the coloration of, of the plants that you get up on the, on the, on the plateaus in, towards the middle of Norway. So that this was, in a way, very much reflecting upon the conditions of Oslo as I found them. Moving to, uh, as, a, as a guest professor one summer in Brisbane, Australia, I noticed that there were these fascinating uh, bungalows, these, these, these metal houses with, with verandas, which had been built by the British in the early days of, of Brisbane uh, in order to get cross-ventilation to keep the buildings away from the, the funny animals that you get there. <laughs> and I simply said a tower could be a re-quotation of these same these same ventilated bungalows, as it were, put one on top of the other. In another city, which I, is coming a little more recently, which is the city where my wife comes from, which is Tel Aviv, I was looking again at the natural conditions of the climate and looking at ways in which drapes between the various layers of the skin could be moved around the tower at different times of the day. Here are some further typical towers. For Paris, a series of apartments which rotate, and behind them, a creeping garden that goes up the building. In the middle, for London, which is the area of Hampstead near where I live, uh, and where London is damp, for those of you whose English enjoys puns, I call the project Dampstead. And the idea was that the, the, the damp would be, the water would be collected in the tanks at the top and allowed to trickle very slowly down the vegetated side of the building. Um, again, for Tel Aviv on the right, the building is located in that, if you look at the plan at the corner, that circular area. There's a circular, uh, a circular area with a blank space in the middle, which was actually invented by Oscar Niemeyer. And he persuaded a series of local architects to build a ring of setback section buildings around it with shops underneath. And he said there should be three towers in the center, but they never built the three towers. Still, even now, they've never built them. So I cheekily said, well, I will suggest three towers that could go in the middle. The key tower, the one that we see here, is in a sense, a symbol of how I read the Tel Avivian psychology, which is being very entrepreneurial. And so the tower is really like a kind of kebab made up of different entrepreneurial elements strung up the kebab. Now, another theme that has interested me tremendously, and I haven't still yet really applied it, is the notion of vegetation but as a a form of urbanism. One of my favorite vegetated uh, pieces is this castle in Würzburg in in Germany, where if you look at the picture, you see that there are a series of parallel pieces of vegetation. The higher hedge, the lower hedge, the little hedge, the little sort of Christmas tree-like objects, then the path, then the lower hedge, then the arbor coming out of the lower hedge, then another embankment of vegetation, then a balustrade, and further trees, so that there are a series almost of striations of different types of vegetation as it has been affected by man. But man can never completely control the vegetation. If you leave it be, it'll, it'll overgrow and become, become wonky. But 
it, it has overtones of an urban of an urban hierarchy, as it were. And then I look at an English garden, which has another kind of interest for me. Again, in the foreground, it's very carefully prepared vegetation. The, 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 the bushes are clipped fairly carefully. In the middle distance, the trees are also still quite circumspect. They're still quite, quite well disciplined. But in the back, in the background, it's weird, it's spooky, it's misty. What goes on there? I'm fascinated by this notion of control, release of control, and mystery, seen almost like theatric layers in space. With my partner these days, Gavin Robottom, uh, we made a project for the Venice Biennale one year where we took a whole piece of East London and we pro proposed a whole series of vegetated insertions into those suburbs. <coughs> and in detail, these often included some quotations of of the things that you've just seen, some quotations of the tradition of the vegetable garden and of the, of the vegetated building and also of, of growing things vertically, borrowed actually again from Germany from the, from the vineyards at Bad Kreuznach in, in the Pfalz. And remaining in Germany, because I often have given many, many, many lectures and very often somebody comes up to you at the end of the lecture and say, there's something like your thing down the road or 10 kilometers away or <coughs> did you ever see this or did you ever... And that's extremely useful and you rush down there the next time you're in the area and you say, my God, there really is. One of my favorite things is in, in Karlsruhe where this piece of engineering was designed so that the vegetation would creep up it in the summer and make an enclosure. Some very boring people said to me, no, 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 it must have been gl glass, and they took the glass away. But no, I've seen the original drawings that proposed it as a vegetated space. <coughs> I was in Melbourne the other day, as one is, and I was just walking along a suburban street, and even then, you get some quite jolly things happening with vegetation. Here's a piece of Melbourne suburban uh, cantilevered vegetation, which I quite like. But for a long time, I have been appropriating some of these ideas. I've been interested in weaving, rather like the Karlsruhe thing, weaving vegetation into an organized structure of having a kind of diagonal vertical park of, of coating buildings with vegetation. A theme that I've already hinted at is the theme of metamorphosis. This is the, the village project, Instant Village, which was probably about a, a one afternoon project. Uh, the idea of a hovercraft which travels and then stops and opens itself out becomes a village. Years later, with the same engineers as worked on this building, as a matter of fact, uh, Klaus Bollinger in his early days, a Bollinger Grumman, he and I did, a, a, with Christine Hawley, a little building that I was teaching in. We had the courtyard, and we made it have a flip-flap roof. But in the summer, the roof opens up, and in the winter, it closes down. It's not as, not as wild as the village, but perhaps it's the same idea sitting around in your head. Sometimes the metamorphosis happens in, in, a, in a kind of proposed, in quite a weird way. This is a project called Way Out West Berlin, where you have to look at the cactus-like object on the right of the drawing, the orange thing, and over time the cactus would take over the building and become the building, which leads, it's a very uh, elaborate project of many, many drawings, leading sometimes to some quite odd hybrids. Remaining with the 
parallel themes of vegetation and metamorphosis. This is a project called the Veg House, the Vegetated House. In plan, you see the triangular area of occupancy. And on the top right, you see a, a cross-section and a picture of, of what it looks like. You note that there's already some vegetation happening, and there's some room enclosures and some beds and power packs and so on. A little time happens, and the vegetation starts to creep in up the armatures. The power pack gets smaller, the rooms can reorganize themselves. The view on the top right is a little bit, little bit stranger. Time goes on, and it becomes more and more romantic. The, 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 com the combination of artifacts is both technical and vegetal. There are pieces of hi-fi that happen in amongst the trees. There are air supplies that happen in amongst the bushes. The, the ceiling become, begins to be a vine. Time moves on, and the vegetation becomes even more insistent. And some, I use some wo words from the English language that, have, that are slightly evocative, the notion of sloping and folding and weaving, and the idea of the glade, which is a very romantic term. And then the drawing moves on. It gets really very wild and strange, and the picture of what it looks like on the top right it's getting very kind of spooky. And the final drawing is virtually out of control. I say, stop, I can't go on any longer. This is, this is too weird. If you can have a veg house, you can also have a veg village. The notion of a number of these suppurating dwellings coexisting side to side to side. Cities under vegetation are also rather interesting. This is the city of Houston in, in the United States, where I was interested in the qualities of Houston as a car city lying under the trees. And what I suggest is that the car city can be programmed, can be electronically programmed, so that you can not have to bother to drive. You just dial in and then you sit back and play cards or read the newspaper or talk to the people in the back of the car and then you glide into the, into the driveway. And in order to mark this endless, endless city, you, you devise a series of emblemic kind of billboards which are in themselves buildings. <laughs> Much more recently, in Crab, we take a, a hypothesis of what happens when global warming, though we haven't had much global warming in the last few months, I must admit, but assuming that they're right about global warming, what will happen when London goes giggling under the sea? And what, what will happen when we have no high-tech left and when we're struggling to survive? We might build a series of sort of wooden kind of enclosures that we crawl up and survive as we climb up. And these mysterious enclosures are kind of like cheap, ramshackle megastructures with strange bodies within them. Though you can see that there are still some of the same themes as, as described before, including the creeping vegetation. On a more practical level, this we applied to a competition project in Mercia where we use both high and low tech uh, systems of, of ventilation and cooling and in fact, we won this competition, but then Spain went broke, and it never happened. Sometimes I invent a construct of vegetation. This is a drawing that I made of a hypothetical piece of landscape where I'm interested in demonstrating the insertion of an apparently architectural set of elements into the vegetation. But then if you examine the vegetation carefully, you see that some of the structuring of the vegetation has architectural overturns. Then there are other parts of the drawing where you can see a very definite architectural object inserted into the vegetation. 
And I'm interested in the in in the kind of lap over in, in the in the ambiguities between what might be structured, what could be structured, what isn't structured, what is juxtap juxtaposed against the structure. Now I move for a moment off my own work and talk about architecture or such things in general. I have a, a question to ask. <coughs> Do too many architects face life with a po face? And then underneath I've explain, explained what that term po faced means. It means grim and over serious. I suggest that many architects uh, are grim and over serious. And I believe one or two of these come from around these parts, but uh, so they tell me. <laughs> but here they all are being very, very serious. And I've broken the system because I, un unlike many of the students this afternoon, I should have made them all black and white photographs. So I've been a bit sloppy there. Well, what I enjoy is what I call creative silliness. I was in Santa Monica, one of my favorite places, and I went out at 7 o'clock in the morning to get the English newspaper, which you can buy in Santa Monica. Came out of the hotel and saw a guy with an animal on his head. You see? A toy animal. What did I do? I went rushing back to the hotel, and I sent an email to my friend Marian Coletti, uh, and I said, there's a guy like you in Santa Monica. And quick as a flash, he came back with another email saying, yes, and I think there's another one somewhere. Because my uncle Coletti, when he was our student, had indeed done animals on his head. Uh, and there is a direct link. And uh, as some of you may know, my uncle is both a, a very esteemed teacher at the Bartlett and is also now a professor in Innsbruck. Uh, and has his doctorate, which if you trace back the origins of the doctoral thesis, you will find that the animals on the head um, project feature. So I would suggest to you that there is a wing of architecture that is not quite as serious, which might include looking at people who have animals on their head. It isn't a, an area that's been deeply investigated so far, but it's wor worthy of study. And after all, we've all been silly in our time. Sometimes I, I give a lecture and somebody suggests, you know, they say that I should go and look at something. And there was a lecture in Vienna about five years ago. And there was a very charming lady came up to me and said, and just gave me an address. I didn't quite know whether this, this was a proposition or, or quite what it was about, but I went along to the address, and it was a shop. And in the window of the shop, there was sausage urbanism. <laughs> there were several plates of sausage urbanism. But, you know, it doesn't have to exist on a plate because you can even go somewhere as sober and, and reasonable as Oslo and find that there's real sausage urbanism. Uh, and, of course, I have a, a penchant for this. They have taken it down, now, I have to admit. But um, it was there for a long time. I have, have to admit that I've done funny things myself in the, in the territory of sausage architecture. Uh, sometimes you have nice, silly situations. My friend Mike Webb, who gives nearly as many lectures as I do, was in Winnipeg, you know, in the University of Manitoba, Winnipeg, and discovered that in the library is an aeroplane. You see? I think it's perfectly reasonable that you have a university, uh, not just with one like here with a wobbly floor, but you can also have a university with an aeroplane in the library. Uh, if you, of course, had a wobbly floor and an aeroplane, that would raise further interesting questions. Now, all of this revolves around, I think, something which we have inherited, which is largely personified by the, the cartoons of a man called William Heath Robinson, who was busy in the early part of the 20th century, before my time. And he invents all sorts of very silly things that very silly people are doing, but there's a thin link with invention. 
And I think there's another wonderful thesis that could be written on the subject of Heath Robinson's work vis-à-vis the British high-tech movement. This thing of inventing silly, funny things that almost do something. We were talking about armatures this afternoon. <coughs> and his project is full of armatures. But we don't have the prerogative of this. You will see in a moment that I am a great lover of kiosks, these small buildings that we don't count as proper architecture. And I was in Valparaiso. We were talking about Valparaiso, weren't we, somebody? And, 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 and uh, I was there photographing a kiosk. And on the left, you see, there's this man with his kiosk, and there's me. He sees that I'm photographing him, and he brings his dog from below the counter so that in the second photograph, it appears as if the dog is running the kiosk. Now, that is absolutely English sense of humor. But he's a Chilean. He's an old Chilean. He cannot know that such things as Heath Robinson existed. <coughs> so we don't have a prerogative. Prerogative. I, I like noses. And I, I'm now lucky enough to be building some noses. I, I'm, I'm sure a psychiatrist would have a, a psychologist would have a lot of uh, interest in why do I like noses? I can't explain it, but I do like noses, and I work them into projects if I can. Um, I'm also interested in the fact that archigram times, we, we suggested a lot of things that broke the edge boundary of what was a legitimate building. We said, you know, a building can move. It can, can have a high facility, but it can move. Well, these mobile coffee shops are, in a sense, in the same mode. And certainly when you get one that has not only the vehicle, the machine, but also the additional envelope, you've almost got to the, one of the typical archigram propositions. It doesn't look like archigram, but in fact it is so. And then, as I collect chaos, I find that they're fascinating as barometers of the culture of a place. Here, for example, is a Swedish uh, kiosk. It's very sensible, rather boring, <laughs> and the sausages aren't very great either. Whereas in Vienna, the sausages are amazing. <laughs> And the people are fat, and the kiosk is full on, and you know, has, has uh, neon lights, and <laughs> the whole works. And in northern Germany, it's a sort of modified form, the rather pleased with itself kiosk. And in Los Angeles, it's big truck, big people, no messing. Whereas in New York, it's mean and touchy. And iffy. And in Melbourne, it's self consciously cultural, because Melbourne is a self consciously cultural town. And in certain parts of Tokyo, it's very, very silly, because Tokyo is marvelous at being very, very silly. The Japanese are very much like the English. We are both people who enjoy really pissing around and doing silly things. And having what is seen as an old culture, but actually sort of sending it up half the time. Now, one of the things that, that because I'm married to a person from Israel, is that the, Israel is seen as a, a deeply troubled country. Um, by the way, the city of Tel Aviv was largely designed by a lethal combination of Scottish town planners and German-trained architects. Think of it. Just stop and think of that <laughs> lethal combination. So part of the party of the urbanism are a series of boulevards. And in the, in, the, in the great German tradition of these boulevards, you have the boulevard with the bourgeois, with the dog, the dog crapping on the boulevard, the trees. And at the end of the boulevard, before it hits the street, is a modernist, rounded-cornered kiosk. Here we have the most successful Tel Aviv kiosk. Uh, the one really amazing place, always has a queue, has the best juice in town, and it is the modernist kiosk at the end of the boulevard. In the city of Frankfurt, Germany, you have similar boulevard, same dog trapping in the thing, 
the same trees, same bourgeoisie. At the end, the rounded corner kiosk. But, oh, it's a bit sad. The guy inside is a miserable Turkish guy who's very sad. And there's some old guy farting outside, and it's all a bit <laughs> miserable. And you think, wait, wait a minute, that's us about face. It should be Tel Aviv where it's trouble, and, 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 and Frankfurt where it's nice and, you know, gleaming. For some weird reason, it's reversed out. Think about it. So sometimes in our uh, uh, office, we, we, we enter kiosk competitions. We, this one didn't seem to... I don't know what happened, because no, they didn't even give a first prize. It just died. But anyhow, we, we've not just looked at kiosks. We've sometimes designed them. And in, in Brisbane, Australia, of course, you get the typical Brizzy thing, which is, again... Lots of big people, very pleased with themselves. And the kiosks are enormous. You even have toilets in them, but they are still technically kiosks. <laughs> and again, again, back to Melbourne. Melbourne is very interesting as a barometer. Some of the kiosks are very effete in selling cacti. And the guy playing on the electric piano is playing Beethoven. And the lady singing in the hat is singing Verdi. Strange. But that's Melbourne. You have to know Melbourne and you realise it's that kind of town. <coughs> we were trying to do a kiosk for London, whether that was right or not, I don't know. Another adjunct to the kiosk is the boardwalk. I'm fascinated by the idea of perambulation, of walking around. As I said earlier, the Bournemouth was developed with these boardwalks amongst the pine trees. And I've been fascinated as a seaside person and as an observer of how people... It's interesting being in that building and seeing how people parade, or, or not, on an undulating internal surface. They don't behave quite the same as they would in a boring horizontal surface. And here the people would walk around the boardwalk, and this is, all, this is for, for an area in Madrid where also one's dealing with cross-ventilation and using the breeze and tucking, tucking kiosks under the body of the main building. The proposition here was this, what I call a kind of hen and chicks situation, where the hen is, is, is the body of the main building, and the chicks are the kiosks that live underneath it, and, and the boardwalk then wraps around the two. And then we see the same thing with a bit of an old, funny Swedish... Boardwalk. More recently, we've been looking at the proposition of an arts boardwalk, a series of, of, of cultural events that is tacked on to a boardwalk that moves amongst, amongst the trees. But our favourite project still, this is about four or five years old now, four years old, um, is a competition that we did for a footbridge. The requirement was for a footbridge between two sides of the river in Skopje. And I said to Gavin, Gavin Robottom, my partner, I said, why don't we put a kiosk on the bridge? Cheer it up a bit. And Gavin said, hey, why don't we move, make the kiosk move backwards and forwards? That'll cheer it up a bit. Then I said, hey, why don't we put a bar on the top of the kiosk that moves and the legs come down like the, on the back of an aeroplane, drop down at six o'clock at night and then, you know, you can have a glass of sliver bits as you look at the river. And the kids can still buy their chalk ices underneath. And uh, we did that. And it's still one of our favourite projects, and I include it in almost every lecture I do, whatever the official content of the lecture, <laughs> in the hope that somebody sitting out there will... Uh, you might have guessed we didn't win the competition. <coughs> in case somebody says, that's just what we want in our town. Um, and I, I, I was actually... <laughs> there was one occasion I was giving this chat, or similar chat, and I showed this project. And it was in Tokyo, of all places. And a bloke at the back said, they built a concrete one. <laughs> there happened to be a guy from Skopje in Tokyo, as, as of course there always is. And 
We knew that they'd build a concrete one. I mean, we were stupid. We knew we couldn't win the competition. But we got off on this notion of the kiosk and the moving and the sliver of its bar. And, and, you know, sometimes you just have to do these things. Sometimes we take a calm European city and look at the tops of the buildings they're quite naughty in their funny way. You probably guessed where this might be. You walk down a little old, unsuspecting Baroque street, and there's a bum hanging out of the <laughs> side of the street because it's the boy, it's our friend, the Kunsthaus. And if you notice, he sits quite comfortably within the grain of the city. He's not... He's like a, I, I think he's like a dog that sits in a bar, sitting nicely in the, in the basket of grass. And we did know grass. I mean, it, 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 you may not realize that actually Colin knows it very, very well. And I had been there probably eight times uh, for various reasons, usually to do with lecturing or teaching and taking students because of the rather interesting architecture that was already there, done largely by the people called the Grazer Schule, which is going to Domenic and Shishkovitz Kavalsi and Klaus Kader and, and Volker Ginka, such people as those who who well, knew of. And um, we entered the competition. There were about 100 odd entries. And I think one of the reasons that we won it was once you've accepted the, the, the bubble, it's a very simple project. It is simply a pin and a skin. The pin is the travelator, and the skin is the periphery. People sit in the restaurant watching their friend going up the travelator into the unknown space above. It's a kind of theatri theatrical progression, up into the unknown. The lower part, the restaurant and so on, is, is very open to the street. It's really a continuation of the street. But up above it sits this mysterious, this mysterious bubble. And the organization is very simple. This is the ground floor plan where you see the diagonal triangulator just moving up between what we call the kangaroo pockets, which are the more solidified parts on the ground floor, and up into the main spaces, which are, are free. One of the things that we had to do was to preserve the piece of building on the left, the Eisenhaus House, the oldest piece of cast iron in southern Austria. And we were told we must keep this because it is part of the local culture. And we laughed like drains when we discovered that the pieces of metal had been brought from England in the 19th century. They'd been shipped down from Sheffield. And we said, this is indigenous culture. So, so much for that. There were some loony, loony English guys in the 19th century who sold the Austrians some bits of metal. And there were some loony English guys at the end of the 20th century who sold some Austrian guys some bits of plastic. So it really comes to the same thing. I mean, that's a very cynical view. But I have a, I have a, I think, legitimately cynical view of what is called indigenous culture. I think everything becomes the vernacular. Once you've done it, this building might have been shocking to some, you know, three years ago, whenever the hell it was. Now it's part of the vernacular. You do white buildings, sure, they can undulate. Why not? Hey? Why not? And why not have skins that can blend from solid to translucent to transparent and back to solid? Something which I've been interested in for a long, long time. Even if the building itself, in a sense, is a craft building, you know, I will admit that the, the juxtaposition of the pieces of plastic are every bit, you know, they're done by, well, to some extent, computer uh, program, but, you know, they're still screwed in by hand. They're still, in a sense, a hand-built object, and they're not high-tech. This building was never high-tech. It's what I call crap-tech. It didn't have the money to be high-tech. 
and would have been totally, totally impossible without the development of the computer. We, neither Colin Fournier nor I can really draw with the computer, but we were, Bollinger and Grumman sent a, a young Austrian architect lady to plot and land the nozzles. We had drawn the nozzles in pencil and so on. And, and, and some of our friends had sort of plotted them by computer, but approximately. This girl came, and we thought, God, it's going it's to be really a nightmare how you land these things, keep the same pitch, and land them on what is, in fact, a, a constantly modulating surface. And the first one took her about half a day to figure out on Rhino how, how, to, how to land it. The second one took about three hours. The third one took about two hours. And she left a day early. She'd plotted them all in about four days. And, 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 and that would have been, you know, in, in the archigram times, we might have thought of something vaguely like this. Who knows? But we wouldn't have been able to carry it through without the development of the computer. And, of course, one of the nozzles doesn't look north. It looks, it's the naughty nozzle. It looks in the direction of the castle. When you stand inside, you look, and you see the castle. And the construction, as I say, is crap tech. It's not high tech. It's a combination of concrete structure, steel structure, insulated panels, infilled, and the nozzles dropped prefabricated elements on top. And there were 27 different contractors and all sorts of strange bits of technology, including lifting bits of it up on the end of a crane and welding in extra pieces of, of steel. And the sectional organization, in, in a way, is very simple, very straightforward. And, of course, at night, the... Hunt, the uh, 920 pixels of light which have a hundred uh, degrees of variability of intensity are able to show movies to be programmed by artists to be programmed by anybody to be linked to certain phenomena going on in the city they can respond to traffic or to the number of people eating chips or whatever you want to program it to and to me, one of the most interesting things, having not done very many buildings, is, is the existence of interstitial space. You don't really get this in the planning stages. You get it as a kind of interesting bonus when the building is constructed. These curious crevices uh, between your building and the adjoining building, where the sky becomes part of the operation. And, of course, there is the constructivist element. When I was a student at the A, there was this wonderful book called Chernikov's 101 Fantasies, which you could see as a special deal in, in the library. And I've always wanted to do a kind of cantilevered element out into the sky, as Chernikov had suggested. And, I, and it was only in Valparaiso I noticed a building which also somebody had been looking at Chernikov. And the notion of the architectural artifact seen amongst trees, as in the drawing, can also be understood in Graz. The journalists did lots of funny things with it. They, many of them refer to it as the blob. The grosser blob. <laughs> or, in England, the attack of the blobs. We have a legitimate tradition of blobs in, in London. We have one of the world's most wonderful blobs. It was done in the 19th century. And we have the television personality, Mr. Blobby. <laughs> I move on to some newer things. I've been fascinated by the color blue, the first blue building, again, 
with Christine Hawley was a little piece of housing in Berlin, which has to count as blue building number one. In Madrid, we moved on to blue building number two, which, if you notice, is that same concept of the hen and chicks, the notion of the body of the building, the housing building, sitting above us, a collection of kiosks. And as proposed, the idea was that there would be sports facilities on the top of the roof, there would be the kiosks as the chicks sitting underneath the building, and then a, quite a complex series of, of automatic shutters on the edge of the building. But you will remember that Spain has gone through an economic crisis, and for, for a year our building stood half-built. Finally, they completed it without the sports facilities, without the shutters, and with only the shelves of the kiosks, which nobody can afford to open a kiosk. But it is there. And I don't know whether to laugh or cry. Um, it, it suggests that, of course, if you have a building which depends upon certain artifacts to make it really, really come alive, but the basic building still does much of what it meant to do because of the organization, because of the ventilation and so on. But it doesn't have all the accoutrements. And this is, this is a very... I mean, for me, I still haven't got my head around what one is meant to say about that. Do you design buildings for the lowest common denominator, hoping that the extra pieces will happen? Or are the extras, in fact, essential to the project? And if you strip back, do you lose the project? I don't know. I haven't been in that situation before. What we do notice is that certain fundamental architectural conditions are, are what's left. We were talking this afternoon about color. We like color. We've done a number of projects where we suggest color. This was a competition for Birmingham Station where we suggested the whole skin of the building would be a series of colours moving from one to the other, with the red facing a rather red brick street, the blue facing future systems blue building, and where circumstantially we could make the colour talk back to the colour that was there. But Birmingham, by and large, is a rather grey city. We thought this colour would also cheer it up. We didn't win the competition. Another color progression was in a project for Taipei. This is a long, about a half a kilometer long strip of, of, of territory where the idea was that it's, it's a series of music buildings. And in the foreground, we see the very brightly colored large building, but done in a stiff architect, deliberately done in a kind of stiff, the steel-like architecture. And then as the strip develops, the architecture loosens. It becomes less stiff and less stiff and less stiff until it becomes quite wild at the end. But, contrapunctally, the colour, as it becomes, the building becomes looser and the colour becomes less. So we look from the other end, we see the very voluptuous pieces of building, which are now monochrome. This is a kind of essay in, in, in sequ sequencing, which we have repeated in one or two other projects. Another tower, m much more recent one, um, is for the area of Swiss Cottage near where I live, which is also t playing the question of color and surface as decoration. But we do do black. We have been known to do black. This was carefully chosen for a Baltic city, which has a tradition of shipbuilding nearby. And we borrowed from the old northern ships, which you got where you used tar, used the asphalt or tar on wood as, as, as the, the finish of the building. And in Italy, we won a competition 
for the municipal theater in Babania. You will notice, you can spot our building in the background there, it is of the color of Babania, which uses a lot of local terracotta. And the proposition of the building was to complete a marketplace and line part of its building up with a system of alleyways that leads down to the lake, also making sure that the volumes and heights of the pieces of building fit with the adjoining heights of the existing building. But the key thing about it is that though it is a municipal theatre, we strongly believe that the real theatre in a little town exists on the outside of the auditorium. In other words, we made great play of the steps up to the theatre and the bars and the cafes that sit on those steps and the space between it and the adjoining building where you could project films and where children could have a kind of open-air theatre. And then the market grows up onto this so that all the things, the tradition that, that theatre doesn't just exist in a fancy auditorium, that theatre is a theatre of the street, um, really informed the project. And the whole thing is meant to creep up and really be more active, probably, on the parts outside the auditorium, though we give them their 500 person auditorium as required. But the real thing is the development of the, again, the interstitial spaces. <coughs> again, partially formed by manipulating the computer and, 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 and developing the project through that. And there's a little bit of an antecedent with another uh, small town project that I did with Christine Hawley, which was for a, a museum, the Glass Museum, where again, the building is very, very carefully tailored to fit with the physiognomy of the town. But back to towers. We've had a run of, of towers based upon the idea of breeding algae. A public, if you go back to the 1963 tower, you'll see that I still regard the tower as an armature upon which things can be hung, rather like a a, 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 rather like a, a coat hanger. And here we put the various droplets which are meant to be carrying the, the tanks for, for growing the algae. In the developed version of the same tower, we looked more closely at the apparatus that is needed for the breeding of, of biofuels via algae. And then, in the final project, we incorporated other means of, of, of uh, using energy, harnessing energy, a lot of solar collectors, wind panel collectors, and the breeding of biofuels. And the idea was that this tower would trickle down into the sheltering of the park in, in Taichung. It's very, very hot. At night, it would glimmer. And within the tower contained a number of subordinate pieces of building, uh, which some of which are laboratories, some of which are public platforms, some things including wedding halls, all sorts of things are threaded onto the tower, which is the carrying armature and then it trickles down into the park and into the city. In Vienna, we won a competition for a law school. The location is very close to the famous Prater Wheel, alongside the Prater Gardens. I took a risk at the final stage of the competition in drawing the odd cartoon. This is my cartoon suggesting that the university can, can have all the funny things that go on in real life. And here's a typical bit of Viennese scenery, people doing all sorts of naughty things, uh, and suggesting that why can't they do that in the university? Um, and we didn't lose the competition. It's a risky thing, but we got away with it. It is to date our largest building. It's very long. In fact, it's two buildings. It's the 
law school, you see, on the left, and lock, almost locking onto it is the central administration. And, and the organization is based upon what we call the sunshine corners. We get the sun coming into the building. And then, as a corollary to the sunshine corners, we get these internal spaces. You can see them marked on this plan with the red X's, these, these pockets, where people can do, th again, do things that are outside the curriculum. We don't just want it to be collection of teaching rooms and interlocutory rooms. We want it to be somewhere where people can also hang out in these slightly loopy spaces with the sunshine corners working uh, as a counterbalance to that. So the top left building is the admin building and the bottom right building is the law building with the law library, that big chunk. Um, oh, I ought to use this one. The law library is this big chunk here which has a garden that goes right over the top of it and down again into the Prata Gardens. Well, it's quite well on. And it's coloured. It's very coloured. Uh, and what we get is one of the noses. This is the, the coffee shop nose. And opposite it, you see the relationship, the coffee shop nose. And then in this piece of building, the, the um, common room nose. And these two noses, which are really, I suppose, like two cheeks, really, greet you as you come into the building. We hope that it, in time, will also grow into the garden, but this is uh, probably our wishful thinking rather than what the uh, Economics University of of Vienna will actually want. It's also whiskered. It has a series of, 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 of slats which deal with some of the sun control uh, and form a kind of whiskered growth on top of the coloured building. Here you see the arrangement of the, of the law library. And some pictures now a bit out of date of the state of play inside the law library, you can see that it's going to be an undulating surface. And there will be a series of pods. These rooms, which are suspended at the highest part of the building, with the garden running over. And the roof lights of the pods are designed so that people can sit on them. So you might be sitting inside the library and see somebody's backside on top of you, which might be quite jolly, we think. <coughs> and it's a coloured building. It's a striped building with the darkest stripes at ground level. And then they become lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter as you reach the sky. But the spine between... We weren't allowed to colour the floors of the small rooms, but the long corridors we make with the darker colour in the lighter rooms and the lighter colour in the darker rooms. Now, I, back to Valparaiso, which I, we were talking about earlier. Somebody's been there. Somebody's done. A variegated, striped building. It was all my dreams come true. And I had been there before, because way back in the 80s I also did a project for a coloured striped building. It's very nice to be able to report that one of the things you've been sitting on as an idea can actually happen. Sometimes we do completely ridiculous competition projects that have no chance of winning, such as this Tsunami Research Centre, where we illustrate it with the tsunami actually happening on the building. <laughs> We suggest another project where the cycling becomes the animator of the university building. You're never bored by any of the, the most boring lecture. If you look out of the window and there are guys whizzing around <laughs> in troughs. Actually, the idea came from being in Kuala Lumpur and watching. There was a funny thing in Kuala Lumpur, uh, which was guys on scooters driving their scooters down about only about a two-metre-wide 
funny sort of trough that somebody had the bright idea, let's get these scooters away from the main street. So we build a trough for them. God knows where they end up at the end of the trough, but all I saw was the one end of it, with these guys dashing down this, this kind of chute. And I thought that would be great for cycling, and the cyclists could animate the building, but we didn't win that one either. <coughs> Sometimes you have an idea, I was asked to do a project for a magazine, and I decided to do something that interested me for a long time, a little bit like the Veg House, but in this case it's not a house, it's a Comfo Veg Club. <laughs> what is a Comfo Veg Club? It's comfortable, it's vegetated, and it's a club. Pretty, you know, that's what a Comfo Veg Club is. I was lucky enough to do a version in Sayak, who have an exhibition gallery a year ago. I went to Sayak and we made a version of the Comfo Veg Club. And writhes around the exhibition space. And indeed, these people are enjoying the Comfort Veg Club. I'm also told, uh, when I was there the other day, that some of them were being very naughty late at night in the Comfort Veg Club, which, of course, is entirely perfectly designed for being very naughty. <laughs> and I've done something here which I've never had the privilege of being able to do before, which is to have a series of ideas, construct some of it, and then say, let's go back, using the constructed part, in suggesting forward. In other words, you have the idea, you do a version constructed. This isn't the whole way. And then you take, you document that constructed bit, and you add then further kind of drawn ideas onto it. So it's like a rollover of the project. Uh, last year we had a number of jolly things. We, we, we won a small competition for the Peruvians. Uh, we constructed that. We had a couple of exhibitions uh, where we investigated. And I and my wife did a, did a kiss table and then we did another. Strange. We're doing some strange furniture, which I'll come to on in a moment. Uh, another competition that we've won is for an architecture school in Queensland, Australia. This is a picture of the architecture school looking towards the entry arch, which was designed by Arata Izasaki. This is our building. It's an architecture school for 300 students. It sits on a little bit of a rise in the ground. And in plan, it is a street which runs through here with a nose uh, announcing the beginning of the street and a series of what we call scoops. You notice each scoop is slightly different. And then the studios, which are on two levels with sometimes stairs going up to the second level. Um, some research rooms and on the second floor, the administration and the head of the school and so on, usual toilets, some, some uh, reading rooms, and a terrace, because we're in Australia, we're in Queensland, which gets very warm. And being Southern Hemisphere, that is north and that is south, so that is the hot side. And so the north side has kept very, very, very small openings with hoods over the windows. And then you have to catch, this is the view from the south with the scoops, and you have to catch, catch the light but not catch the sun. You have to be very careful not to let direct, sun, it's extremely bright sunlight. And you have to hold that but get the light in. And here's a further explanation. So we see the street, the scoops, and the southern wall, which is the cooler side, and the nose. And a view looking down the street, the stairs winding up. The scoops are really quite, quite large. The building is quite high and airy, and probably, we hope, quite dramatic. 
with the light, but not the sun. Only very, very occasionally do you allow a little bit of sun to come through. And at night, slightly spooky. It involved a lot of, of manipulation. Again, this would have been impossible without the computer and also impossible without a proprietary type of special German expandable shuttering. The Aussies down there had not come across this shuttering very much. They were a bit scared of what and said. It's all got, got to be expensive, right? But we, 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 we persuaded them on, the, on, the, on using the shuttering. And then by putting our cleverest person in, in, in the office on the case, she, she sorted out how you could use very, very few variations of the geometry and still get the variety of scoops. Now, you have to remember that at the time when this cropped up about three years ago, I had already been myself involved in teaching in architecture schools for 45 or more years. And Gavin had been involved in teaching in architecture schools for 12 years. And a lot of it, therefore, is the anecdotal evidence of architecture school, not just what you read in the, you know, the metric handbook or one of these things that tells you where to put classrooms, but actually what goes on in the school of architecture. This is the cap. Now, my 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 friends in the office said, "Oh, it was a good idea when you did those cartoons for Vienna. Do some more cartoons." I did about five or six. They said, "Oh, do some more cartoons." In the end, I did about twenty odd cartoons. Uh, as part of the competition submission, and we still won the competition. But it's really life imitating art. Um, my, my colleague's favorite caption is this one, where there's a very pompous, I can only do an English pompous accent, um, of some bright, bright, smart ass critic sitting there and saying, I question your terms of reference, Barbara. And there's Barbara sort of reading from her notes, and, and, and uh, Barbara's friend, Wally, kind of def definitely unnerved, and, and, and their friend, Charlie, who's wired up this thing, which isn't going to work, but, but <laughs> it's definitely, you know, I have had years, particularly at the Bartlett, of, of interesting pieces of gadgetry where the teacher says, um, he had it working on Tuesday, you know, and then you do the crit, because it doesn't fucking work. And then you're going down the corridor the next day, and they say, we got it to work just after you left. You know, it's a story of my life. Well, there is life imitating art. This is actually in art, but it, there, there she is with her notes and, and some smart ass sitting in the front row. <coughs> a very useful thing is to remember, also, as Gavin and I do, knocking around lots of architects, to rem remember different, different examples. We said, hey, do you remember that, that thing they have at UCLA? They have this rather good device where there's a high-level corridor where you can look at what's going on in the crypt, but you don't interfere with the crypt. If you're really interested, then you go down the spiral staircase and go in the room. But you can, you can eavesdrop. And this is a quote of that where a, there's a, one of the teachers and, and, and a visitor who looked suspiciously like Odile Deck, walking along, looking at her, oh, they're pretty bright kids. The other thing which we think probably helped us win the competition was that the university saw the building as a kind of useful general purpose building for events. But this was a piece of me flattering the locals by suggesting that, of course, there would be people from Princeton coming on crits. Uh, or this, which is a social situation with which we've, we're all familiar, uh, how to organize the platforms of the upper level and encourage students to be there. Here's this poor character <laughs> who imagines that he might be able to get off with the girl over there. I think he, he stands very little chance, but it might encourage him to come into the building a bit more. And here's another piece taken from life, encouraging people to to work late at night, and of course it's Aussie land, so they've got a bottle of, you know, the amber liquid on, on, on the table, and uh, things not going too well, but uh, never mind. 
And uh, chicken and egg is something which we're all familiar with in, in academe. Um, don't forget the, the town, Gold Coast, which is where this is, is a big beach town. There, there is even a part of Gold Coast called Surface Paradise. It's a big surfing scene. So here is Jules, who's uh, nice to see in the building again, Jules. <laughs> Jules hasn't been anywhere near college for about three, four weeks. Uh, but he's caught, and there's the, one of the faculty members drawing his attention. The other faculty member doesn't want to get involved in this. Con I know from the other side of the cat and mouse game that, that my key activity on being appointed to a new school of architecture or to, be mo or to have a new room has been to figure out how to escape particularly if you're running the school, there's always somebody incredibly boring heading in your direction. And the key thing is to try and find a route by which you can just get out quick enough. <coughs> so the cat and mouse operates both ways round. We have designed the furniture for the building and it has been constructed. It's waiting now in a series of containers to be shipped from China, where it's cheaper to build furniture. We had to keep the furniture within the Australian uh, norms of costing. It had to be as cheap as ordinary, this kind of thing, Australian academic furniture. So we ended up having it made in Shenzhen, checked in Hong Kong, quality controlled in Hong Kong, and it's being shipped out as we speak. And I think it'll look amazing with the the characteristics of the building and this, this locking together of furniture, which is all kind of color-coded. And the building is, is well on. This is a, a little bit way back, actually, now. You see the progress as it was about three months ago on the site. And the nose exists. And the building is rapidly taking shape. These are some of the existing architecture students down there, allowed in for the first time. Uh, the roof is now actually on this part of the building, and you can see it's looking pretty much like the drawings. Uh, and there it is, with the roof going on, and the other end. And then finally, another funny group of people who I haven't uh, given the storyline to yet, but they are people familiar from my history of, of people who uh, work in an art environment. And this is back, strangely enough, to the same Bournemouth where I first was a student, which in the years that I've been away has become a grander institution and has recently been made its own full university, a university of the arts. And I have been commissioned to do a small building for drawing, so these characters are some more characters I know in a building for drawing where we also throw, we simultaneously have been throwing the project around the computer, looking at it in all sorts of various juxtapositions and simultaneously making handmade models of the building. And as it stands, it's going to be a strange animal sitting in amongst the trees, uh, probably of steel construction, flanged steel. It's the latest version, although the earlier version there was suggesting it was a lamella timber construction. We've moved a bit off that onto, onto proposing it in steel. And that's it, really. We have quite a funny time. That's Gavin and I pissing about, and people coming and eating, and sitting and arguing, and discussing. And if you want to find out more, go on the website. Thank you. <laughs> oh. Thank you very much, Peter.
There is a bit of time for questions. Would anyone like to ask some questions? Come for a club again on the, <laughs> that's the screen saver. <laughs> I guess it has been a long day also for you. <laughs> no questions? Thank you very much for a wonderful lecture. It has been Thank great you. to have you here. Well, it's nice to come here every 38 years. <laughs>